Okay. Good evening and welcome you all uh, to the Westmont Downtown Series. This is Conversations About Things That Matter. I'm Bobby Kinnear and I'm a member of the Westmont Foundation Board. And it is the Westmont Foundation Board that sponsors this series, which began in October 2005. The series highlights important topics of the day and the information is brought to you by the amazing Westmont faculty. Where kind of the agenda for today is I will start off by talking a little bit about the role of the National Security Advisor and Secretary of State. Chris will then discuss uh, just war doctrine as it applies to Iraq. And Robert will conclude by talking about the legacy of the, the Bush doctrine. And I, I think if we limit our remarks to about 12 minutes, we should have ample time for, for question and answers uh, for the audience. Um, I, I want to start by, by telling you guys a, a personal story of my relationship with, with Dr. Rice. Um, I was an undergraduate at Stanford University when she was there, both as a professor and as provost. And um, I actually took uh, her Soviet politics class back in the era that there was such a thing as Soviet politics. Um, it didn't do very well in the class, which might um, affect my remarks here tonight, so you need to take them with a grain of salt. Um, and she was a great professor. I really enjoyed studying from her. But um, in, in preparation for her coming here to, to Westmont, um, I read her autobiography, Extraordinary Ordinary People, and she talks about um, when she was provost at Stanford, um, story of Bill Walsh, who was a legendary 49er coach, came back to, to Stanford, coached final two years there. But she told a story about uh, the middle of the 1994 season. Um, the team wasn't doing very well. Bill Walsh came into her, her office visibly upset um, and said he wanted to tender his resignation. He was shaking and just said, I can't go on. The team's too bad. Uh, I've lost my passion for, for coaching and, and I want to quit. And um, I'm not proud to say I was part of that team that gave Bill Walsh a nervous breakdown. And um, <laughs> I'm sure I personally played no small role in his emotional collapse. Um, so that out of the way, I, I want to talk in, in first in general terms about the difference between the national security advisor, or the position of the national security advisor, and the position of secretary of state. Um, and, and as most of you are probably aware, uh, Condoleezza Rice was the national security advisor during uh, George Walker Bush's first term in office, secretary of state during the second term. And even though both positions are um, incredibly important, they're, they're both quite different. And the central difference between the National Security Advisor and the Secretary of State comes from the confirmation process. Uh, National Security Advisor is not confirmed by the Senate, but the Secretary of State is. And that simple fact has pretty big implications for both accountability and responsibility. As National Security Advisor, um, you're really not accountable to anybody but the President. You serve at the pleasure of the President. And therefore, you operate without congressional oversight. Um, there's also not a whole lot of staff to, to manage other than kind of the small skeleton staff in the NSC. Um, the role of the National Security Advisor is really twofold. The first is to act as an honest broker. Um, being an honest broker means giving the president unvarnished, realistic alternatives on all sides of a policy issue. The, the second role of a national security advisor is to champion and carry out the president's policies. And, and part of that is to make sure that the bureaucracy is doing what the president wants it to do. Um, bureaucracy, in, in this case, being mainly Department of State and Department of Defense. The Secretary of State, by contrast, is accountable to and responsible to a lot of different people. Um, certainly, the, the Secretary of State is charged with carrying out the president's foreign policies. But the Secretary of State is also responsible to Congress. Um, Congress has budgetary responsibility for the State Department, also has oversight. So the Secretary of State really is, uh, has two masters, has to, has to uh, please both the President and Congress. But in, in a bigger sense, too, the Secretary also has to account for the institutional needs of the State Department. Part of that is um, 
engaging in diplomacy with other countries, um, but also part of that is to, quite frankly, enlarge the budget and enlarge the importance of the State Department. Um, they're also responsible for a large number of employees, or roughly about 20,000 employees of the State Department, most of whom are civil servants that um, are career bureaucrats, probably there a lot longer than the Secretary of State and, and any of the political appointees, which kind of creates its own special challenge. You're, you're, you're basically managing people that have been there longer than you, probably know a whole lot more about the institution than you do. Um, so what's the result? What, what does this matter? Um, presidents usually structure their foreign policy advisory networks to suit their needs and their own desires. And, and this is not always the case, but it's, it's been the general trend that the National Security Council and the National Security Advisor has grown in importance vis-a-vis -vis the State Department over the years. Um, why? Uh, well, the simple reason is that presidents typically distrust the bureaucracy. The old adage is where you sit is, is where you stand, which means that presidents often fear that their cabinet has gone native and they're interested more in the best interest of their own department than they are in their own, um, in the president's interest. I, I was watching the Sunday morning talk shows and I think a good example of this um, might be Barack Obama in dealing with Egypt. Um, one of the commentators said one of the biggest challenges that Barack Obama had in dealing with Egypt was his own State Department, who was reluctant to move quickly um, to kind of call for Mubarak's um, stepping down. So um, I don't want to minimize the importance of the Secretary of State. I, I, it's still an important position, arguably the number two position behind the president when it comes to foreign policy making. But one of the hallmarks of the modern presidency has been this attempt to consolidate power within the White House. And the National Security Council, at least when it comes to foreign policy, is part of that attempt. Um, and as you might imagine, this can create tension between the State Department, Department of Defense, and the National Security Council and the White House. And oftentimes, cabinet level secretaries bristle at being told what to do by White House employees many of whom are, are still in their 20s and 30s, and so that doesn't often sit well. Um, so what was Dr. Rice's experience like as, as both National Security Advisor and Secretary of State? Um, she had a tough job in, in both positions. As National Security Advisor, she had to deal with some very strong and very experienced foreign policy players, foremost among them um, Dick Cheney, Don Rumsfeld, and Colin Powell. Um, and, and there was a lot of tension within the, the Bush White House, uh, as particularly between Colin Powell and the Cheney-Rumsfeld um, kind of relationship. Uh, Rumsfeld has uh, mentioned that he kind of resented, oftentimes, Condoleezza Rice's intrusion into the policymaking process in, in terms of the Pentagon and, and Department of Defense in, in his autobiography that just came out recently, uh, entitled Known and Unknown. He writes that she, Condoleezza Rice, and her staff didn't seem to understand that they were not in the chain of command. Um, pretty interesting statement, but it kind of reflects this tension that we see between White House staff and, uh, and executive agencies. And, and oftentimes, and this is um, from a couple of reports from Bush administration officials, that the Department of Defense sometimes came late to NSC meetings wouldn't come at all, or would send more junior people than maybe the, the meeting allowed. Um, and, and Condoleezza Rice has expressed some frustration with her role as National Security Advisor, even though I think she ultimately liked the position. But she said that uh, National Security Advisor, this is her words, it is a great job because you're working very close to the President, you're working with him, but it's also a very difficult job because everything is by remote control, you do not own any of the assets. Now that would change when she became Secretary of State, but as National Security Advisor, it's a, it's a tough position to be in. So how did Dr. Rice handle the role of an honest broker, somebody that would give the President all different sides of a, of a political issue? And I think here it's, it's a mixed bag. Um, I, I think when it came to Afghanistan, um, she was actually quite good at raising objections from major principles on certain aspects of policy. 
the president was pushing for an early war, an early bombing of Afghanistan. Some of the principal decision makers were uncomfortable with that in the time frame, and, and she raised that that possibility with the uh, with the president, and they kind of hashed it out. Um, but I, I also think there were times that um, she could have been better honest broker. I, was, I, I think especially when it comes to Iraq. Um, the decision to go to war when I, with Iraq was in many ways a question of how and when rather than a question of if and ought we do this. And, and I think that oftentimes um, there were voices of dissent within the Bush administration that somehow didn't get a, a full hearing both on the decision to go to war and a lot of the, um, a lot of the policies involved including uh, the disbanding of the Iraqi army. Uh, the other role of the National Security Advisor to champion the President's policy, I think Dr. Rice did a, a fantastic job. Um, it was a disciplined White House that rarely strayed from message. Um, she gave a convincing voice, I think for the most part, to the Bush Doctrine. And she was a loyal and, and trusted advisor to a President who really valued loyalty and, and, and personal relationships. Um, her experience in the, in the second term of the Bush administration as Secretary of State uh, she just entered into an unbelievably difficult context. Um, it was, uh, the United States was fighting a two-front war, things were not going well in Iraq. Uh, you have a lame duck president that's unpopular both at home and abroad. Uh, you have a hostile Congress, especially after the 2006 midterm election. And, and so we, we probably wouldn't expect any, you know, wonderful foreign policy accomplishments to, to come out of that second term. Uh, I, I think that there were some accomplishments. I think foreign aid, especially to Africa, increased quite dramatically. Um, Condoleezza Rice worked unbelievably hard to try to mend fences, especially with our European allies. Uh, you know, the, the popular impression is that Colin Powell is this multilateralist and, and Condoleezza Rice is a unilateralist, but she actually spent more time in Europe and abroad than Colin Powell ever did. Um, as Secretary of State. Uh, and, and U.S. foreign policy did take a more multilateral turn. You can see it in the um, negotiations with both North Korea and uh, attempt to, to deal with Iran. Um, yet it, it still was a difficult environment. You still had the war on I, I, Iraq was not going well. Um, there was an, a kind of a attempt to restart the Israeli-Palestinian peace process that, that fizzled out towards the end. Um, so just in a context as Secretary of State, um, just a very, very difficult, difficult position to be in. So um, I think I'm probably close to the end of my time. I'll just conclude by saying that um, even though the roles are very different uh, between National Security Advisor and Secretary of State, I think Condoleezza Rice was one of those few individuals, largely based on her personal relationship with Bush, that um, was a trusted advisor in both of them. Uh, I think she was, uh, she had the president's ear, she had the president's trust, both as national security advisor and as secretary of state. So um, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Chris. Thank you, John. I will uh, steward my time better if I uh, read my remarks, so forgive me if that seems a little wooden, but um, hopefully it will in the end uh, give us a better opportunity for conversation. Um, I should note at the outset that uh, though I'm grateful to be taking part in this panel, um, I am an odd person to have chosen to be on it. Um, as uh, Rick pointed out, I'm a philosopher by training and not a political scientist or a historian. So I can't speak with the specificity that you might hope for um, on the legacy of Condoleezza Rice for instance, on her changing role in the different positions she held, as Tom just has, or on her lasting influence on American foreign relations. I hope, though, that I can uh, bring something to the discussion tonight. As a philosopher, I am particularly interested in ethical questions uh, surrounding war. And those questions, as you'll remember, were very much at issue in what was arguably the defining event in the Bush administration foreign policy, uh, the Iraq War. What I hope to offer tonight is a brief reflection on the legacy of Bush administration foreign policy for the state of ethical thinking 
about war in American society. Let's begin by returning to the six or eight months before the invasion of Iraq in spring 2003. You'll recall that the administration was engaged in a remarkably public debate about whether to invade. As the months went by, the question more and more seemed to turn on the existence of an Iraqi program to develop WMDs. Why? Why was the existence of an Iraqi program to develop WMDs thought to be decisive for whether invasion was justified? Why might the invasion have been justified if there were WMDs, but not if there weren't? That the WMD question was thought to be decisive shows, I think, that a very old tradition in moral reflection about war, the so-called just war tradition, was playing an important role in public debate. According to that tradition, long the dominant viewpoint on the ethics of war in the Christian tradition, but also very influential in the broader society today, according to that tradition, war may justly be entered into only in response to aggression. Importantly, again, according to the just war tradition, one is not justified in initiating hostilities, even if doing so increases one's security, even if doing so weakens an adversary's ability to engage in imminent aggression. One may use force, according to this tradition, only in response to aggression. You can see what a severe constraint that is on policymakers' freedom to use force. And you can see what a thorn it would have been in the side of those convinced that American security or long-term interests were best served by initiating hostilities in Iraq. What to do? Challenge the reasonableness of the constraint by noting that it fails to account for a crucial element in contemporary warfare. Limiting oneself to only responding to aggression and not preempting aggression might have been reasonable when the destructive capabilities of the aggressor were more limited. In a world where aggressors can nearly instantly and without warning destroy whole cities with a nuclear device, can it be reasonable to limit oneself to responding to aggression? Must not one be morally justified in preempting aggression? Must not one in these circumstances be justified in initiating hostilities? Must not the traditional just war constraints on going to war be revised in light of our contemporary circumstances? This is why the alleged presence of WMDs was so important to our national debate prior to the invasion. If those who would have initially opposed invasion on the grounds that it violated the just war prohibition on initiating hostilities could be convinced that this prohibition needed revision in light of the destructive power of WMDs, then a major voice in opposition to the war would be stilled. All that remained to be done would be to demonstrate the existence, or at least the likely existence, of a WMD program in Iraq. We often forget this prior debate, the one about whether preemptive attack is justified in the face of the threat of WMDs. But it was raging in late 2002 among those who appealed to the just war, sorry, to just war principles for guidance in their thinking about the ethics of the invasion. I saw this especially among Christian churches and individual Christian theologians and ethicists. And speaking personally, what I saw was deeply disappointing. Sickening, really. I saw very respectable ethicists becoming, I thought, tools in an administration effort to gain public support or at least acquiescence for a war that I suspected it wanted for reasons other than defense against imminent or even distant threat of attack. In the end, this prior debate 
about the revision of just war constraints to allow preemptive attack was unresolved. But that's all the administration needed. As long as it was thought a debatable question, there would be no united front in opposition to the war among people of faith and others committed to the just war tradition. The administration could move on to making the case that we all remember so well, that Iraq had a WMD development program that justified preemptive attack. <clears throat> what is my point in reminding us of these events? Not to argue that the war was morally unjustified. There are, I think, far clearer reasons for that, including that it arguably violated another major just war constraint on the use of force, that it be a last resort. That too, you'll recall, was hotly debated. No, my point is actually about the just war tradition itself as a basis for evaluating the justifiability of war. It is highly malleable. Perhaps that is a strength. New technologies are developed. New social and political contexts emerge. Perhaps the malleability of the just war tradition is what keeps it relevant to ever-changing contexts for warfare. But that malleability also has a real danger that we relax just war constraints on the use of force, not just in response to changing contexts, but so that we can justify the war or the means of waging war that we currently want or feel that we need. As evidence for just how far the just war position can flex when we feel we need it to, consider nuclear deterrence. Nuclear deterrence was the threat of a nuclear attack on civilian populations in response to aggression, an attack that would have deliberately, not unintentionally, not as collateral damage, but deliberately killed hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of non-combatants. What clearer violation of, just war, of the just war principle of non-combatant immunity could there be? Yet this was our military policy from roughly 1950 to about four months ago. That it could be our policy, even in a society where many claim to support just war, just war constraints on the use of force, reveals, I have to say, the frightening malleability of just war principles. And the results of debates about the justifiability of the invasion of Iraq, not to mention debates about the treatment of prisoners later in the war, serve to show that same malleability. This, I believe, is the philosophical legacy of the foreign policy that Condoleezza Rice helped shape. The just war tradition has, once again, and perhaps, though I doubt it, finally, been shown to be malleable to the point of impotence. Though it appears to offer constraints on when and how we may use force, in fact, it regularly fails to constrain us. We adjust it to fit the war we want or feel we need. Those of us who believe that, ethic, that ethics have any bearing at all on warfare that moral considerations, not just strategic or political ones, might actually constrain our use of force, are driven to other views on the ethics of war. My own is pacifism. What will yours be? Thanks. I, I hope everybody can uh, please bear with me. I've actually been in bed for most of the last two days with whatever it is that's going through all the four-year-olds in town. Um, <laughs> see my daughter. Um, <clears throat> I'll try to stick to the uh, 10 to 12 minute uh, limit here. I would, I'm going to be talking a little bit uh, more broadly about the Bush Doctrine, and uh, in particular Condoleezza's Rice, her, her, uh, the change in her thinking over time. And I'm very interested in that because 
My thinking changed a lot also post 9-11, and it's important for us to remember that the, the baseline for the Bush administration was much more like Bush's dad's administration. It was really around um, realism, around realpolitik, around not messing with the internal politics of countries, understanding what the distribution of power was, being very pragmatic. That was the case for Don Rumsfeld, it was the case for Bush, it was the case for Rice, it was the case for Cheney wasn't the case for Wolfowitz. And so one of the big question marks is, how does a really smart PhD from Stanford, like Condoleezza Rice, go from being a realist to being lumped in as a neocon over a short period of time? I think I can give some insight into that for a few different reasons. One is my thinking went through a parallel change. Um, I also had pretty good contact with a few people in the Bush administration. I, I happened to be at um, Princeton on a postdoc when uh, the Iraq war was winding up. And in interestingly enough, a few people at Princeton um, do sort of fit into it. When you're uh, doing strategy or business or law or anything else, there's sort of always two questions. What do you know and what do you do about it? Very simple. What do you know? What do you do about it? In the case of post 9-11, the question is, why do they hate us? Why are they attacking us? And what should we do about it? In the American constellation of foreign policy throughout much of most of the Cold War period and the post-Cold War period, there was really um, one foreign policy, and that one was largely containment. You think of sort of three different goals that you have. Whatever the status quo is today, you can either keep the status quo, you can try to push the status quo back, or you can try to change to something new. And during the majority of the Cold War, both parties, there was a very you know, bipartisan consensus during the Cold War, it was containment. We contained the Soviets. Eisenhower, during his uh, election bid, flirted with the concept of rollback, but we quickly backed off of it again. Um, Reagan pushed for rollback uh, more during the first administration than the second, but largely things are around containment. Some people a little bit more on the accommodation side, like Nixon with the taunt, but containment. It was containment, containment, containment. 9-11 happens, and uh, there was real strategic thinking and administration, and in, in terms of the view that a lot of the dissenting thought and other things were, were quelched, my view is I generally disagree with that. I think they brought in a lot of experts from a lot of different um, viewpoints, and that ended up actually leading to a, a pretty big change in the thinking of, of key people along with Rice. Um, at the macro level, there was a quick determination made, and that determination was that there's three things that we need to fear and the three things by themselves aren't that bad, but if they come together, if they come together, um, it, it's, you know, it's catastrophe. And the three things are weapons of mass destruction, rogue states, and terrorism. That if those three things intersect, we have something that could change life in America as we know it. And for the West, on weapons of mass destruction, if you go back and look carefully, the primary concern was around biological weapons, chemical weapons to a lesser degree, nukes to a lesser degree, it was really biological weapons that concerned them, a series of rogue states, and with rogue states we can throw in failed states, and then the connection of um, terrorists, especially sort of non-state actor terrorists, transnational movements that were going across state borders. The question is, why did the terrorists hate us? Why did Al-Qaeda hate us and other Al-Qaeda um, hang-ons? There's really four different ways that you can try to answer the question. One is they hate us because of what we do, that we're imperialists, that we put our nose where it doesn't belong because of Israel. Secondly, it's they hate who we are. It's our freedoms. And by freedoms, it also means our licentiousness, the decadence of our society. It's unpiousness. A third thing could be it's nothing to do with us at all. It's purely about them. Their goal is to establish a global caliphate. And really, if it's us or Europe or Russia or China, they don't care. Their goal, they have a revolutionary doctrine it's to establish a global caliphate. The fourth one is also them. It's really that people that like violence latch on to whatever explanation they can, but in the end, they're just nihilists that like violence. So there's four different um, potential answers circulating out there, and depending which of those four answers you uh, levitate towards, and what you think of the threat of weapons of mass destruction, rogue states, and terrorism, you're gonna come up with very different responses. During the Cold War, containment made a lot of sense. Let's just keep the status quo. Um, people in the Bush administration really went back and they reread um, Osama bin Laden's 96 and 98 declarations of war against Jews and Crusaders. There's no mention of, of Israel. There's no mention of Palestinians. 
There's no mention of those things. He's upset for all sorts of reasons. He's calling on the uh, international Muslim jihad. He's calling for an international global caliphate. His three reasons for saying that Americans, Jews, and Crusaders should be attacked and murdered where they stand is because we were containing Iraq, which was starving Iraqi children, because we had troops based in Saudi Arabia, Holy Land, and because we repeatedly, um, uh, along with the bombing, that Iraqi children were starving. So we're, we're actually bombing one Muslim nation and is allowing us to bomb another one. Saad bin Laden's own words. There's no Israel and Palestine in there. This is, all, this is all later on. This is later on, too, when he's saying, if you're in a red state, we'll attack you, and you're in a blue state, we won't attack you. His argument changed a lot over time. So they went back, they looked at what he was actually saying he was upset about. There were some other little connections, too, from Princeton. Bernard Lewis, What Went Wrong. Um, I think a lot of historians don't like the book. I love the book. It pretty much shows a thousand year, very sad backslide in the Middle East. And the uh, conclusion that they came to, looking at all of this, was, well, um, it's not about Israel. If we pull out of Israel, if we change this connection or change that connection, the argument will just continue to morph, revolve. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I'm really um, sick and trying to just um, keep up with this. Um, actually, some running low on time. Let me move on to the, to the next point. What do we do about it? If it's not just a, if it's not um, purely about our policy per se, but if there's a group of people that are actually out there that are upset with um, the overall structure of the international system, I've been sick all day, just um, pardon, pardon me just for one second, I'm just trying to stay on, um, keep it together. Okay, I think I'm better. <laughs> my, uh, I've courtesy of my daughter, um, I know what she's been going through the last couple days, and, or it was last week when it hit her, and I'm praying that's not going to hit me right now. Um, all right, so what do, we do, what do we do about this? They come to the conclusion, looking at it, that it's, the establishment of a global caliphate. It's not specifically our policy about Israel. It's not tactical things that we've done. Al Qaeda is plotting against us while Bill Clinton's president. This isn't a reaction to George Bush and the neoconservatives. This is a reaction. This is this is Bill Clinton's been in office. We've been doing all the things that people are now saying is supposed to be the um, the you know the, the response to the answer. Their reading of history is a little different from uh, a lot of other people's. They look at things like World War II, and we didn't use the word regime change, but the answer is they looked at World War II, a different template than the Cold War and containment. The template in World War II is regime change. We're going to go into Germany. We're going to go into Je Japan. We're going to decapitate them. We're going to implant democracy and free markets in the heart of two regions that have brought nothing but bloodshed for centuries. And you can look at Germany and say, well, it's Caucasian, it's Christian. You can make a lot of arguments about why it would work in Germany, but why would it work in Japan? Asian, Shinto, there was no Weimar Republic. None of those things matter. It looks kind of insane if you really think about trying to plant it in Japan. The answer was cut the head off in Japan, plant democracy in there, project American power and force into Japan. And guess what? Regions that have caused a couple world wars that have been at, at, at war for centuries are going to be pacified. So they're talking to Bernard Lewis, they're talking to Nathan Sharansky, who ends up writing a book as a result of some of those early conversations, The Case for Democracy, which is a wonderful book. And they say, you know what? The problem isn't too little American power. The problem is not enough American power, and we need to project it into that region. And so we're, we've, we've got causes belli with Iraq. They continuously light up our aircraft. They fire on us. They try to assassinate a former president. They're not living up to the 1990 ceasefire agreement. We don't need a UN Security Council resolution. We're still at a state of war. They're violating that resolution. So we're going to resume hostilities. And we're already in Afghanistan now, so we're projecting power into two spots. We have great pincer, pincer movement in there, causes belly with Iraq. Let's, let's go in. That was I'm not saying I'm agreeing with it, disagreeing with it. This is the, this is the thinking that was happening. And so they pushed ahead with the Iraq war. Um, Let me just conclude with a joke. I'm looking forward to, uh, I don't know how far away it'll be. It, it, things are quicker. 
uh, what we're seeing happening in Egypt and Libya and elsewhere, this was the hope for in 10, 15, 20 years from now. Um, it's happening a little quicker than anybody possibly expected. By that I mean things like the Philippines and Korea and Spain and places that, you know, they didn't quite fall in 45. It took decades for it to happen. But what I'm looking forward to in 20 years from now is if the U.S. is considering uh, who would it be? Would it be Jenna Bush, I guess, or something like that? Or maybe um, uh, so something like that. Jenna Bush is running for president. She just got elected, and she's announcing war plans someplace in sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America. And the democratically elected official from Iraq and Afghanistan, along with Germany and Japan, will all stand up and condemn us for our um, blatant imperialism. And I will, I will enjoy that moment in 20 or 30 years from now. Let me stop there.